She-Hulk, attorney at law. That was diabolical. Well, you jumped the gun a little there, but seriously, this show is atrocious. The MCU's been trying for more gender balance in its output for some time, with Kevin Feige quoted in 2018 as saying, but as the plan goes forward, I think frankly will be, you know, eventually I think we're going to reach a time when it's not just, listen, it would be amazing to see all of our female characters the way we've seen most, never all male, but primarily male. I think we're getting to the point where soon we'll have so many great female characters that those are just our heroes, as opposed to when they're all female or male. It's just the f Marvel heroes, more than half of which will be women. So I hope that makes sense. In a recent article in CBR titled She-Hulk Director Breaks Down the Importance of the Show's Female Lens, they covered director and executive producer Kat Coiro speaking to Entertainment Weekly about how the show will also attempt to showcase a powerful female superhero who also happens to be a lawyer. And just as the screen will be filled with women, behind the scenes the series will also creatively be crafted by a group of women who understood just what to bring to the MCU. She said, we're not there yet, but I hope that this show is part of that movement, where it's just accepted that some shows are predominantly led by women because that's how life is. It was definitely something we talked about, about inclusivity and making sure that the story was told through the female lens. This is just a declaration of activism at this point, and they seem more interested in that than they are in delivering entertainment. So it appears that Marvel purposely went out of their way to hire a predominantly female writing team for the project. She-Hulk, attorney at law. The problem is that without anyone there to give insight on the male lens, the show's male characters are one-dimensional and unrealistic caricatures. It's the exact mirror of what Marvel previously identified as the problem of not having a female perspective. They've not solved that, instead they just now don't have a male one. It's like they used to have a problem while driving of veering off the road to the left and crashing, and now they feel that it's real progress that instead they're veering off to the right side of the road and crashing. So rejoice! Marvel and Disney have decided to end gender discrimination and sexism once and for all. Disney have decided to end gender-based discrimination once and for all through a rigorous schedule of committed gender discrimination. It's a bold choice and likes to be as fruitful as trying to end forest fires by preemptively burning all of the trees. So let's see if Marvel Studios can do better with episode 3 of She-Hulk, Attorney at Law, a superhero series that makes the audacious decision if episode 2 is anything to go by of containing no superpowers and no heroism whatsoever. Instead, it has oodles of legal paperwork. <laughs> yeah. A lot of this is the show of legal yeah. paperwork, yeah, which right. we knew <laughs> is what the MCU fans were screaming for. That stands repeating for emphasis. A superhero series containing no superpowers and no heroism. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for them. But before I get on to the review, there's something I need to deal with first. She-Hulk's origin story because this will come up later. The 1980 comic, The Savage She-Hulk, is where She-Hulk gets her original origin story from. Note from her cover art, Jen's charming red hair. We won't be seeing that again because for some unknown reason, Hollywood writers hate redheads. In this story, Bruce is on his way to see his cousin Jen, who's a lawyer. He tells her the story of how he became Hulk. Meanwhile, DA Jen is already on a case. She has a man who's been framed for murder by a mobster and is facing prison. She puts out the rumour that she has evidence that will convict the head mobster of the murder instead to draw a response from him. And she gets a response. The mobster sends men to kill her and they shoot her through the chest. Jen is losing a lot of blood so Bruce chases off the mobsters and tries to help her. He sees she's losing blood too fast so he takes her to a nearby doctor's house and gives her a blood transfusion of his own blood to save her life. Bruce then calls for help. He's wanted by the authorities so he's forced to run. Jen is taken to hospital to recover. The mobsters turn up again dressed as doctors to finish the job. Jen gets angry when the mobsters attack her and turns into She-Hulk. The mobsters are forced to run away and she chases them down the hall, through the hospital and out into the street. She catches them in the street and they confess that their boss murdered the man in front of the police. Jen goes back upstairs and gets back into bed so no one will know it was her and says, the blood transfusion must have caused it. I've become a gamma ray monster just like Doc. But I'll learn to live with it. 
From now on, whatever Jennifer Walters can't handle, She-Hulk will do. And that's it for Savage She-Hulk number one. 18 pages covered the original origin story and a better one than She-Hulk Attorney at Law did. It's not perfect, some parts are maybe contrived, but it shows Jen as idealistic, a crusader for justice, a risk taker, and already heroic by episode one. It shows more heroism and superpowers than She-Hulk Attorney at Law has managed to show in three episodes totaling approximately 90 minutes of content. In She-Hulk, Attorney at Law, they swap that for Jen talking about Captain America's virginity when she gets startled by a spacecraft ex machina and crashes the car getting Bruce's blood on her. So they made the origin story and character markedly worse. But you can see why they were confident. Let's see who wrote that clapped out origin story that they changed. Oh, it's Stan Lee. Well, what would he know about writing superheroes? Stand aside, Stan, because Jessica Gow is here. You may have co-created the Spider-Man, the X-Man, Iron Man, Thor, the Hulk, Ant-Man, the Wasp, the Fantastic Four, Black Panther, Daredevil, Doctor Strange, the Scarlet Witch, Black Widow, Iron Man, She-Hulk, Thanos, Doctor Doom, and frankly a list of characters so long it's almost embarrassing, but here's Jessica Gow with some better ideas. Now instead we have a prolonged scene in a bathroom and She-Hulk twerking with Megan the Stallion. Thank God the show is written by feminist activists now and seen through the female lens so we can finally have a female superhero with dignity. Maybe, just maybe, you should have stuck with the story that made the character popular in the first place. Though it may be better if you don't try and do fight scenes. They tried that in episode 1 when Jamila Jamil tried a fly kick and all she managed to do was catastrophically damage her anus. Where, where was I? Oh yeah, She-Hulk, attorney at law. Jen goes to see Tim Roth to find out why he'd broken out of jail. He explains to her that he didn't. Wong from Doctor Strange did it. Wong turned up, portaled Tim Roth away and made him fight in a cage match. Jen's annoying assistant tries to track down Wong, the mystical sorcerer supreme, in order for him to testify in Tim Roth's case. And they find Wong, the mystical source of Supreme, on LinkedIn. I could barely contain my amusement. It's there for an unfunny joke, it makes no sense. This is She-Hulk, attorney at law. Jen arrives at the office and the CGI is still terrible. It has no feeling of weight, she looks like she's floating. The shadows seem off. All of it screams out that you're not looking at a solid object or something that's really there. Dennis the straw man is back because he needs a lawyer and they need to humiliate him again. He explains that he's been defrauded for $175,000 by a shape-shifting elf pretending to be Megan the Stallion. He then comes back in to say he's calling off the case and it took me half a second to realise that it was the shape-shifting elf pretending to be him. The writing in this is one large cliché. It's the parole hearing of Tim Roth that runs simultaneously with the court case involving the elf which for some reason has the real Megan the Stallion sitting in the crowd. There's been almost no superpowers and no heroism in the show, so when Jessica Gow said, <laughs> yeah. a lot of This is the show of legal yeah. paperwork, yeah, which right. we knew is what the MCU fans were screaming for. Sadly, she wasn't joking, though it can admittedly be rarely hard to tell. During the parole hearing, one of the board asked Blonsky, How can we trust you won't turn into the monster and run wild? So Blonsky turns into the Abomination to show he can maintain control, and despite forewarning them, the parole board all freak out. Why are they even doing this in a maximum security prison when it could be done by video link? Wong turns up late to win the case, and I don't even recognise the character from Doctor Strange. I'm not even convinced the writers of the show even watched the film. Jen wins the parole hearing, and outside a journalist asks her, Is there any truth? You got your powers from a mafia hit. The audacity to even bring that up after what you changed it into. Jen humiliates Dennis the straw man again for good measure and then goes back to the office to twerk with Megan the Stallion. This is not a joke. I wish it was. She rarely did twerk with Megan the Stallion and the CGI was god awful. Later some hoodlums attack Jen and try and get away with some of her blood in a bad action sequence that will likely go nowhere interesting. Someone wants her blood, maybe Titania, to make herself stronger. It's going somewhere and rest assured it will be tedious. 
Who knows? Maybe Jamelia Jamil needs the Hulk blood to repair her catastrophically savaged anus. <coughs> <coughs>